Greetings, math friends. I have received a comment from a viewer to prove uh, a certain idea, and I want to leave over here the original comment. I've pulled out some key ideas from the comment. Uh, we have a function f with its inverse g, and we want to know that if f is rising, prove g is also rising. So these were the key ideas. This is a really deep and interesting question. If you dig around on the internet, which I did, I found a few uh, questions, articles, uh, discussions over on the Math Stack Exchange discussing different aspects of these ideas. So you can go explore that for yourself if you want. Try to type in variations of this and see kind of the uh, discussions that happen over there. This question, the way that we have it, is not very rigorous. And that's what leads to some of the debate. Uh, really, mathematics should not be a terribly highly debatable topic um, if we phrase things um, so that we have a nice, rigorous, defined understanding of what we're discussing. And as this is stated right here, it is not that. So one of our jobs, first of all, will be to state this in a rigorous way so that we can go forward and answer the question. Uh, first of all, we're going to need uh, potentially some definitions. Uh, so what do we really mean by rising? And also, what do we mean by inverse? Some of you may be thinking that that was not one of the words that I was going to question, uh, but those of you that have a uh, more in-depth mathematical background, you probably um, had an, a question of what do we mean by inverse there as well. I think for the most part we assume a certain inverse, but those of us with a deeper background, uh, we do have to uh, question that. So first of all, I'm going to reference a couple of textbooks. I just finished teaching the semester that we we're just ending. I have been teaching uh, two undergraduate courses, one in discrete mathematics and the other in introductory real analysis. So this question comes at a really nice time for me because I'm already in the mindset of these types of questions as I was just teaching a course uh, that relates to this. So I'm going to reference a couple of textbooks. Um, Edward Galgan's Introduction to Real Analysis. Or it says to analysis, but it's mostly real analysis. And then also the Intermediate Mathematical Analysis by Labar. This was the textbook that I used to teach the course that I just finished, but I really like Galgan's book. Galgan's book is really thin. This book has material in it, but maybe not at the depth that some people would like. Uh, one of the reasons I went to Labar here in looking at definitions is because one of the definitions that I wanted I couldn't find in this textbook, so I had to go back to Labar to pull out that uh, definition that I wanted in discussing what we really need to state this as to be rigorous. So you will see that I have uh, my first three definitions I'm pulling from Galgan. So definition one talks about uh, how we define a sequence to be increasing. Uh, definition two discusses uh, what uh, we mean when we introduce the word monotone as a part of a descriptor. And then definition three is specifically about a function that is increasing. And hopefully you can see some of the relationship between these three definitions. Uh, we then go over to Labar for our fourth definition, and this is again about a function, but now we are saying that the function is strictly monotonic 
increasing. So we're bringing in the descriptors from the first three definitions and adding this other descriptor of strictly. And you see what we do is we remove the equality statement from our inequalities so that they are strictly inequalities. And Labar has uh, an exercise in his textbook that is very much related to the question that I have been asked by the commenter. So that's interesting uh, that Labar has something very similar to that. Lastly, uh, now that we've discussed what we could potentially used to define rising as far as um, increasing, monotonic, and strictly, we need to talk about inverse. Inverse, if your background is only in high school, you probably know that um, for f and g to be inverses, if we start with f, we have to determine that it is one-to-one -one and onto. And then if we know that condition exists, then we know that we can find an inverse function, in this case named g. However, if you have had some other mathematical training, or if your textbook or teacher was more oriented toward detail, you might have had some discussions or noticed that the idea of inverse does not completely rely on one-to-one -one and onto. In higher mathematics, we call this bijection. If you look at a inverse, one of the things that you are sometimes taught is to compose these two functions. So let's quickly look at what that is. So we could have f compose g of some, say the uh, independent variable would be x. Then this is some result here. If these are inverses of each other, we should get x back, the independent input. Um, really, uh, on a deeper level, we say that this is the identity. But if you've studied composition, then you know that this is not commutative. And what we mean by that is that if we literally commute these functions, that the result here could be different from here. That's what we mean by non-commutative. If these were commutative with this operation, then it wouldn't matter what order we put them in, we would get the same result. We are very comfortable with commutativity because this happens for us many times. 2 plus 3 is 5, and also 3 plus 2 is 5. This is something that we've probably had since first grade and we are very comfortable with commutativity. However, with the composition of functions, this is not a commutative operation. So we don't really know what goes in the box here, even if we know that this result is x. Notice that in one place, I have the function g on the right-hand side, and on the other, I have the function g on the left-hand side. If g is, as stated, an inverse, then this is a right inverse and this is a left inverse. So we could have some result here, removing the x that I had here, to discuss the idea of this not being commutative. If we compose f with g, we get some result which should be an identity, Let's call this i, d, y. Since this is not commutative, this would give us a different result than this, say, i, d, x. 
The type of inverse that you are probably used to from high school is that it doesn't matter the order. And in that case, really, you are starting with the assumption that F is bijective or one to one and onto, and then the order doesn't matter. In this case, we have a right inverse, and in this case, we have a left inverse, and they're giving us different results. To have the result the same, we need to have both right and left inverses at the same time. So I believe that is really what the commenter wants when they say inverse here, is that G is acting as both a left and right hand inverse. I really, myself, did not understand this until I had some students a few years ago challenge me to do homework exercises from Harvard's notorious Math 55A. You, ha you may or may not have heard of that class. If you get online, you can read about that class. Harvard themselves has a statement about the class, and they have posted homework exercises in the past online. The exercise set that I saw that I did problem one for was related to understanding how inverses really need to be approached. And it was essentially you had to write four different proofs, if I remember right, uh, for just the first question to demonstrate what really happens when we talk about functions and inverses. So I found that problem incredibly educational. I did not go to Harvard myself. I went to a couple other universities, but I still found that exercise to be incredibly educational. It's at this point we need to rewrite this in a rigorous way so that we can start to move forward with some kind of a proof. Um, and I'm going to try to rewrite this in a rigorous way so that I try to capture what I believe is the intention of the commenter's original question. All right, I believe this is the theorem that the commenter really wants proven. If I'm wrong, a comment can be left. Uh, if you see a problem with this, you may also leave a comment. I start out by defining the function uh, from set A to B, where A and B are contained in the real numbers. So this is a real, real number valued function. And this function is also strictly monotonically increasing. Okay, so that is, um, we're stating that f is rising here, and we're saying where f exists. We further are going to say that the function f, um, if the function f has an inverse function named g, where g is defined from b to a for every uh, element that is in B, then G is strictly monotonically increasing also. All right, so let's move forward with a proof. Uh, your proof may not look like mine, uh, but hopefully I have captured what I need to to demonstrate that this will work. You might also want to question for yourself. I know this question or the idea or comment was mentioned on the Math Stack Exchange that if this is not uh, strictly monotonically increasing, that this breaks down. So you might explore that. Why is it that this doesn't work that way? All right, so let's begin the proof. The first thing that I'm going to do is declare a sequence. I'm going to let the sequence x sub n, where n runs from 1 to k. So this is a sequence. It's however big that it's going to need to be. 
and n and k need to be um, natural numbers. All right, so this sequence is all going to be elements of set A, which is our domain for function f. All right, so that's what we're declaring here. And then we're going to make a statement about the image of these values. And I'm just going to write this as an all in one type of statement. So the image of every element in here in its entirety is going to be the set B. So for this sequence of individual terms, they are making up the set A and the image of these terms are going to be B. Further, to make sure that we don't end up with something that is left or a right, we're not just going to merely call these the elements of A, but to make sure that we know that every one of these things comprise all of A, we're going to say that this is equal to A. So now, these aren't just some elements of A. I want to make sure that we know that these are every element of A. Because if we just say that these are elements of A, there could be other elements in set A, meaning that the order of A could potentially be larger than the order of B, and that's going to be an important change where we could potentially have inverses uh, and F not be one to one and onto. All right? So every one of these elements is A, and then we're going to take the image of every one of these elements to become B, and that process is with respect to F. Now that we know that set A is not empty and it is comprised of this sequence, we're going to take any two elements from the sequence, say x sub n and x sub n plus 1. So what happens when we take any arbitrary two elements from here? Well, we know that the function f has been declared to be strictly monotonically increasing. So these elements here, coming from the domain, have an order to them. So which, with our natural way of thinking, uh, the number before we added something to it is going to be the smaller one than the number that we add one to, which is giving us a successor in the sequence. And since f is strictly monotonically increasing, this implies that f of x sub n must be less than f of x sub n plus 1, the images of these values. All right, so now we can make a statement about uh, b, which is the image of all the elements of a.
All right. This inequality is showing that the images of A, which are the elements of B, have this ordering to them, and it's a strict inequality. So the set B has to be strictly monotonically increasing also as a sequence. I'm going to have to adjust some things because I'm running out of room here, but we are close to being done with this proof. I've adjusted the camera a little bit so that we can still see the theorem we're trying to prove and the first half of the proof, and now we're hopefully going to be able to conclude this. All right, so we've stated that B is a strictly monotonically increasing sequence. This is important to progressing forward. So we're going to say there is some function g now, and we are going to define this from b to a, so set b to a, that's the expected way that we have an inverse work. It's going to undo everything that we've done. So this is b, this is the domain of g. It has this condition. Likewise, when we looked at um, when we looked at what we defined as the set A up here, we had this inequality condition. Since we have this, this implies that if I take G and operate it on this sequence the image of this is going to be the set A. So we're going to run these numbers through the function of G. So we're going to have that G of F of X sub N should be less than G of F of X sub N plus 1. Well, what is the image of this? Well, that is just elements from A. What do elements of A look like? Well, elements of A are the sequence, which are these values here, which are exactly what is in here. So this is really saying that this is x sub n, which is less than x sub n plus 1. Well, this was the anticipation because this is what we had up here. So this is the sequence A. Again, it has a strict ordering to it. In fact, this matches the definition that we saw earlier. So by definition, the function G has to be strictly monotonically increasing also. And that ends our proof. So I hope I didn't miss anything when I wrote this proof out. Again, you can comment below if you think I missed anything. Uh, hopefully that I've got this stated rigorously enough uh, that we can proceed and get this uh, as a workable proof. As we look at moving from the original statement to this, um, Decisions had to be made. Uh, how were we going to state this in a rigorous way? What things were we going to include as a part of the statement? And what were we going to leave out? I think a lot of students who haven't had a lot of opportunity to explore mathematics in an open thought forum really don't understand the imagination, the creativity, and the choices that they have in mathematics. It's an unfortunate situation. Uh, students feel very locked in. They feel like it's just a list of rules. They don't understand it, and um, they don't understand how people talk about uh, being creative in mathematics. Um, we would probably do better as teachers, instructors, and if we could uh, help students understand the creativity that can be involved in mathematics. When students don't understand that, 
creativity is available, that freedom is available, uh, I think it restricts what they're um, able to do and what their, uh, their um, enjoyment level of mathematics is. Uh, on a side note, I think this affects people's thinking of religion also. If they see religion as just a set of rules that has to be followed and there's no um, room for their own thinking, then they don't think there's really choice or free will. This could be one way that mathematics helps people understand other aspects of life. I hope you find some mathematics in your part of the world that you can enjoy and share with others. Cheerful calculations. <laughs>